Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service here in Hernando County. And with me today for what is this about the third week in a row, we're on a roll here, is my regular co-host, Lily Browning, who's our Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator. Good morning, Lily. How are you? I'm just great, Bill. How are you? I'm here. I'm doing yeah. well. Yeah, that's good. I see you're in your office today. Yes. Your, your office office, not your remote office. Yes, I'm at the office office and everything seems to be working correctly at the moment. Maybe <laughs> 10 minutes ago, uh, the Spectrum Internet people pulled up out front. I thought, oh, great, they're going to start working on wires. I'm going to get clipped off or something. But they promptly drove off. I'm not sure what they did. They weren't here for just a few minutes. And our and, offices, um, yeah, our offices are what about six miles apart. Yeah, but I was having issues um, with the internet this morning too. So it, it's working now. My little blue cord, my long blue cord here, my Ethernet cord. I kept sticking it in the wall and in the computer, and then <laughs> turning them around and trying again. And finally, it decided, eh, we'll give you internet now. Yeah, the technology doesn't always work, and everybody should be aware that if all of a sudden one day we're doing this and one of us disappears or we both disappear, sorry, it's just the internet. <laughs> well, on the last few times you were working from work there, you kept disappearing, and I it was like that commercial where the exact same families are side to side, but on the one with the bad connection. They yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they keep disappearing and popping on and off. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was a uh, computer problem I was having that I think I have a workaround that will hopefully work. Hopefully work for an hour here. And we have a question on here already from That's Robin. Fantastic. Great. I think Robin might be a new listener, which is great. Robin asks, hi there. I would like to plant pumpkins. Is it too late? What kind should I plant? Thank you. It's not too late, I don't think. I'm trying to figure out which part of this to answer first. Technically, it's not too late because here in Central Florida, you want to plant them generally around middle of July. So you're, this is what, July 21st? That's what it says here? That's so you're, computer says, yes. Mm -hmm. right now is a good time to plant them. The problem is pumpkins have a lot of insect pests and especially disease problems because when it gets really rainy, humid, and wet, all the pumpkins and cantaloupes and summer squash and things like that are gonna have a lot of disease ooh, problems. Ooh, ooh, I know what they are, I know what they are. Ooh, ooh, ooh. They are cucurbits. Very good, do you know what <laughs> plant family they're, they're in? What family they're in? Mm -hmm. Cucurbitaceae. Oh, okay. You're <laughs> close. I, I could have guessed that one. You just add A-C-E on the end of random words, and that's a family. Exactly. That, that just means it's the family. Yeah. So, sure, you go, if you're in, so, Robin, if you're in Central Florida, and I'm never really sure where anybody is at any good given moment, but if you're here in Central Florida, you can plant regular traditional pumpkins now. They're going to be tough, and you're really going to want to get uh, some kind of fungicide and spray them regularly with that. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of problems. Neem oil is not going to cut it. Diatomaceous earth is not going to cut it. It's not going to help with the problems that you're probably going to have with it. But Sam makes a good suggestion here. He has good luck with seminal pumpkins. Mm -hmm. Seminal pumpkins, I believe, is a native vegetable. It's what the seminal Indians grew in Florida. <clears throat> and seminal pumpkins and calabasa. Which, which are Cuban pumpkins, and they're very closely related. They're both winter squash, just like a pumpkin is. And I have calabasa growing in my backyard. Oh, my gosh. It's been rambling over a bigger and bigger area in the corner of the backyard. And it just got a kick for some reason and just doubled down on growing. So I really haven't gotten anything off of it yet, but I should get a number of winter squash like Seminole pumpkins, they are much more disease resistant. You're going to have far, far fewer um, 
disease problems with that. But you're not going to have them looking like the emoji she put here. If she, if you're looking for your classic fall pumpkin, you know, when the different churches and other things have pumpkin patches and everyone runs and gets their pictures and it's so cute because it's fall. We put on our sweaters, even though it's 87 degrees. And you know where they get those pumpkins? Mostly Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is one of the states they got a problem. Ohio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they have them shipped down from up north. Now, you can grow them here, but like you said, it might be a, a struggle. Yeah, so to get a really big jack-o'-lantern type pumpkin here at any time of the year is difficult. You can grow the smaller uh, pie pumpkins, which you can either turn into pumpkin pie or pumpkin cookies or whatever you want to do, or just eat it like a winter squash because it is a winter squash. I always buy a few every year in the fall at the grocery stores and cook them up as winter squash. I like it. So you can grow the smaller ones. It's just the really big ones that turn into the big Chaco lantern pumpkin. Very, very difficult to do here. She's in Northwest Tampa. Now that doesn't mean that one won't start to grow, but will it fruit is, you know, another question because I'm, I've known people who've had pumpkins uh, volunteer from where they started to rot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. compost pile. That's right. the problem. Mm -hmm. but, but whether or not you actually, you, you know, it's difficult to get a nice big jack-o'-lantern pumpkin here because of, like you said, all the issues with the squashes and the humidity and the insects and everything. A lot of fungal disease problems. They're little yeah. fungus magnets, really. Um, but you Seminole pumpkins have fewer disease problems. So, so Robin, I'm sure everybody's going to chime in with their, their winter squash things. Sean asked, with calabasa, the time to plant? I planted mine earlier this summer. You should still be able to plant them right now, but I get them in very quickly, and they're going to grow, and they're going to mature, and you're going to get the squash closer to fall time than summer. So calabasa, a year or two ago, we had a class online and the video is still available i'll have to dig that up and share the link i think i'm not even sure that should be in the um hernando county youtube page but i'll dig that up uh we had dr maru who's with university of florida and he's the calabasa researcher and uh somebody it may even be somebody tuning in today emailed me and said i grew calabasa and it came out really good she sent a picture, this calabasa, it was like over 40 pounds. It was literally wow. this big. It was huge. So what do, you do with, what do you do with it? She brought a smaller one in and gave it to me, and it was huge. I mean, we had dinner off of it really? six times. Easy. How do you prepare it? I looked online, and I found a Cuban recipe for it with cilantro, olive oil, hot pepper some other things if you look online you'll find a lot of cooking uh hmm. ideas or you can just peel it cut it up into cubes and cook it just like you would any squash, of squash acorn squash anything like that interesting hmm. and sharon asks about butternut squash you can grow it here it's easier to grow in the spring than it is in the fall in the spring, you want to, I, you know, start it maybe in little containers and transplant it out. I'd say March first, because you needed to get it to grow quickly and give you squash. Because during the heat of summer, once again, you're going to have a lot of disease problems with butternut squash. Butternut can be very difficult to grow here because of the diseases. Fungicides help. You see Carol Ann's question about a rubber tree. How do you trim a rubber tree plant, Lily? <laughs> I was afraid you were going to ask me that. I really have no idea. Um, <laughs> well, I know that as a general rule, if you have something like that growing in a pot, it may have outgrown the pot. So ideally, you want to pull it out and repot it into a larger pot. And when you pull it out, 
if the roots are really matted and circling, now there's all roots, no dirt. And when you water it, the water just kind of runs off the top. It doesn't really percolate through the soil because there's no soil anymore, just roots. So you can repot it in a bigger pot. You can pull it out and root trim it, which is trim back the roots around the edges and put it back in the same pot. And that will help it to grow better. Um, rubber trees, I know that the clippings or a piece that breaks off, you can root it very easily, can't you? Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, it says here to snip from the top from what I'm seeing. And, and of course, like any other um, trimming that you're doing, you really don't want to remove more than a third. Yeah. Yeah. Don't take too much off. Don't don't hat rack it or chop it down to the yes. ground. You want to start at a node. You know, just like any other plants, too. So that will encourage new growth. Um, you know, that's what I would suggest. That will make it shorter. Rubber trees generally don't get too terribly wide. If it has one of those branches that's sticking out and poking you every time you walk by, you can shorten it a little bit. And going back to Calabasa, mm -hmm. Sean, bingo, that's exactly what I did. I looked online and you ch cut the calabasa up into chunks cilantro garlic lime either some jalapeno or hot pepper i probably added fajita seasonings and i roasted it in the oven and it was it was excellent it was mm. very very good and you can That's find good. calabasa a lot of times at most any grocery store Really? And smaller um, specialty grocery stores, you can find it. Can we do another taste test of this calabasa? You're going to cook it so I can. I'd have to cook it. Yeah, so, I know. Um, yeah, the dragon fruit was easy, but see, now I want you to cook something for, for Bernie and I to try. I'll plan on that. I could pick one up at the store. That's no problem. Um, we do have a microwave here. I'll have to make sure that it's working and it's clean. <laughs> uh, to reheat it and we'll try it. Yeah. Like I said, I thought it was really, really good. Cool. And here we have a question about a cross vine. It's growing great up the side of my house. Can you direct it or train it to go in certain directions? What happens if I trim it? Will it branch into that? Hmm. Are you the, the cross vine Not expert really. today? <laughs> There's hard questions today, Bill. I know. But again, we're, we're a variety of questions. Yes, let me see what IFAS has to say. Um, I imagine it's like any other vine. Um, I'm making sure that it's, you know, okay, it's a native. <laughs> yes. Um, you okay. can obviously direct it or train it. Any mm -hmm. kind of vine, you can physically grab it and point it in the direction you want it to go in. You may have to, um, you didn't really say if it's trellised or not. If it's trellised, it's a lot easier to make it go where you want right, it to right, go. Right. Um, if you trim it, you could take all the trimmings and try planting them, try um, starting them as cuttings mm -hmm. if you want to start a bunch more plants. Although you might, if it's getting kind of late, I mean, if you want to do it right this second, because that they are early winter spring bloomers. So that's something you need to be, you know, careful with any kind of spring bloomer. Today is the, you know, last day you want to even take a chance of pruning them because you might be cutting off your, your early, your late winter or early spring blooms something to consider as well it's attached to the stucco well, that's interesting so a little harder to train that way if you can't put it in and out and through like fence links or something by advertising on youtube here we go i pulled up the link to the uh calabasa class and this is on the hernando county government's youtube channel 
where we have a lot of the different classes that we've given. Lily has about what, 300 on there? So, 350? 82. Um, there will be 83, but John's on vacation this week, so it won't be <laughs> this week. Um, the class that I did yesterday with Rita will be on there soon. Um, but I contacted John about something else, and I don't know why. I mean, I called his work phone, and I went to his cell phone, and he answered. So I don't know why, because I found out he was on vacation. He shouldn't have answered his phone. But <laughs> So all that to say is it'll be a little bit delayed getting Rita and I's class about native plants on the YouTube channel. But it's on, the, it's on my Facebook page. I think it went really, really well. So um, as far as that vine, um, I'm not sure how you can train it, you know, if it's only attached to stucco, it usually needs something like some kind of lattice work or something. Otherwise, it's just going to go where it wants to go. But like I said, I think you'll be cutting off the blooms if, you, if you're cutting, pruning it too heavily now. I have, yeah. I, planted, I have not had luck in my current yard. I had a lot of luck in the yard I used to live in, in downtown Brooksville, near downtown Brooksville, with passion vine, where I live now in the drier, sandy areas. I've not had any luck with passion vine, and I planted some last year, and I thought, well, it's not going to grow either, either, but you know what I see growing up now? <laughs> I thought it was gone, and I've got some passion vine going up my fence, so we'll see. I found out my issue with the passion vine is not so much that it doesn't want to grow, is that the tortoises really like it. <laughs> so, you know, that's a good thing, too. I'm not going to. You know, I try to put rocks I get, on one. <laughs> I get huge numbers of caterpillars on mine, which is fine. Yes, that doesn't bother yes, me. Yes. Okay. And passion vine is funny because you could plant it in one spot and it promptly dies. And and go up here, the next spring, on. boom, it pops up 20 feet away. Mm -hmm. It'll be popping up all over your yard. It travels far and wide underground. It has its own mind of what it wants to do. Exactly. And Robin asks, is there a group or organization that will come to my house and help me prepare my soil for vegetable gardening? Not that I know of, mm -hmm. but that's a very, very good tie-in with all of the class videos that we have on the Hernando County YouTube channel because I have a number of them that are recorded classes for growing different types of vegetable crops, things like sweet potatoes, calabasa, strawberries, a couple of others, can't remember what they are off the top of my head. They're all there. And if you look under the Florida Friendly Landscape playlist, Lily has, seriously, like your 70s or 80s? 82. Yeah. 82 yeah. classes on yeah. there. So if you're growing stuff in the shade or when the sun or winter or you want flowers, whatever you want, she's probably got a class that covers it. You have one on soil health from the ground up on your playlist in there, too. Yep. <clears throat> and I so think the, you might so even have, there might be some on Florida Friendly, uh, growing your vegetable garden in a Florida Friendly manner. And you had discussed having one of those classes i think you need to do it in september weren't you going to bring somebody else in to talk about that yeah uh that's on my to-do list is to plan out classes september is a bad month because i'm gone for the, almost the entire month oh okay but well august then because you know if they want to start their fall garden i'll be glad to handle the um Florida friendly portion of it. It used to be that Florida friendly uh, just kind of veered away from didn't handle vegetable gardening because the point of Florida friendly was low maintenance, you know, you know, ornamental plants. But then they began, you know, I think what they did is started hiring in um, people who were vegetable experts, you know, as Florida friendly agents. And so they even have a publication now that how you can grow your vegetable garden using Florida friendly principles. And I think that's a neat combination. And I would be glad to handle that portion of it if you want to arrange the class, but I'm booked on Wednesdays. 
<laughs> August through September myself. And I'll be gone uh, a couple of weeks in September as well. But we said we need to fit it in August at some point. Yes, I'll plan on that and we'll put something together. We do need to go back and redo some, you know, basic vegetable gardening sure. and yes. fall vegetable gardening, winter vegetable gardening. And I just pulled up, I'm pretty sure this is a fairly new um, fact sheet, edible landscaping using the nine Florida friendly landscaping principles. Which is exactly what I plan to rely on heavily to teach um, that portion of that class <laughs> so you know sometimes um i'm just really inspired with ideas and i do this research and everything sometimes i find a university of florida publication and literally just work right off of that and just put it into pretty slides and then explain it to you in layman's terms done that <laughs> yeah um, plenty of times too here let me um, see who wrote this um Tia is the main author on this. Yeah, I get Tia to do the class. She did um, pineapples for me. Tia and Tina that. McIntyre. Yeah, I know all these people. Hey, yeah, I thought you meant Maybe I can get Wendy Wilbur to teach it. That'd okay. be great. Oh, is so, there yeah. a, is that questions just pouring in here, Bill? Okay. Where can we buy seeds? Online, you're not going to find them at a big box store. Uh, you can find them for Seminole Pumpkin. You can find it for Calabasa. If you look online, the specialty seed companies carry them. So they're available. Um, I got both of mine from people who grew them. So any kind of winter squash, when you um, harvest it and you cut it open, just scoop the seeds out and clean them off like you would pumpkin seeds dry them really really well and plant them that's what i did with mine but you can buy them online and um robin you can always email one of us we'll show our email near the end and we can send you links in case you're overwhelmed with what you're looking at on hernando county government youtube um yeah. we'll send you the links for classes that'll help you get started um that kind of since she's talking about vegetable gardening um kind of segues into uh, compost classes. In general, we do offer composting classes. <laughs> and in fact, we have a video on that, you and I do. Yes, we do. With Dr. Bill and Down to Earth Lil on <laughs> that one talking about composting. We have our compost workshops, um, but right now, the compost bins, which are handled by Carmen Bruno, he's our recycling coordinator from Hernando County Solid Waste. I have to give my boss credit, and she was really thinking of price points that she pushed me to do two rain barrel orders in, you know, pretty quick succession because we wanted to purchase some before the prices went up again. So I have a good amount of rain barrels. Carmen's compost bins. <laughs> our stock somewhere in supply chain purgatory so we have a waiting list right now as soon as they ever come in they're with your master gardener's pots somewhere is they, they did have. we finally got pots okay. and it was a huge order and when i verified the charge i had to mention the reason why the charge is so large when we got so many pots it's because they've been out of stock literally for six months. We weren't yeah. able to get pots. Yes. So anyway, when the, so I have a compost bin workshop waiting list. You know, you just email me and get on the waiting list. And whenever they come in, we'll start having those compost classes again. Compost is a great thing to help with your vegetable garden. All that, just to say <laughs> that. But email one of us and we'll send you some of the links that will help you, you know, in your journey. Okay, we have a question about potted eggplants and somebody has eggplants that are three feet tall and not getting any eggplants at the moment. 
if your if your container is about five gallons or bigger, you're fine. But you can't put you can't grow an eggplant in like a little one gallon or three gallon pot. It needs to be about five gallons. <clears throat> and eggplants can survive the summer. They don't always, but they can. But they're not going to produce for a while during June, July, and August. Too hot. So if you can keep your eggplants alive. And because it's in a container, you should be able to move it where maybe it's getting morning sun, definitely late afternoon shade so it doesn't burn up. If you keep it alive and healthy in the fall when the days get a little bit shorter, you should get eggplants off of it then. You may want to use um, fungicide on it if you start to have a lot of fungal leaf spot problems. I have eggplants. I just I planted the seeds a few weeks ago. And they're all, they're coming up, they're a couple inches tall, almost ready to go in the garden. I like oh, it. The plants, not the, not the fruit. Correct. Just the, just the plants. I'm starting them for fall. Very nice. I so, have a volunteer tomato, again, cherry tomato, came out of my compost bin. And um, so I'm keeping it in the shade and seeing if it's, you know, going to not burn up through the summer it, it i keep seeing yellow blossoms on it i'm like you're not keeping those i know you're going to throw those off yeah yeah <laughs> but my goal is well let's see if the plant itself is gonna you know live through the summer and then maybe it'll start producing again in september or october or so it's possible with the things that you grow in the spring eggplants basically have the best chance of surviving the summer they're somewhat tropical some people grow eggplants and actually get eggplants off of them all summer. A lot of times you don't. Or if it does get pollinated, you get a little eggplant, it gets sunburnt and scorched, so it's not very good. Peppers are kind of the second. Peppers, there's at least a 50-50 chance you can keep them alive over the summer. Um, you're probably not going to get any peppers off them. Sometimes hot peppers will keep producing all summer, but no guarantee. And then tomatoes are the diciest. Tomatoes rarely well, survive they are the because of diseases. Yeah. The cherry tomatoes seem to be tougher than your, you know, your heirloom tomatoes or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just stick with Roma tomatoes, the, little, the plum tomatoes, mm -hmm. and cherry tomatoes. You're going to have the best chance of getting actual food on your dinner table with them. I didn't choose it. It came up. <laughs> Well, obviously, I yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you didn't plan them. on it, but I have thrown them cherry tomato seeds, obviously, in my compost. And then the one came up last January, and I went on vacation. I was afraid it was going to freeze, so I gave it to my son-in-law, and then it didn't return to me. I get pictures of it occasionally, <laughs> <laughs> so my compost rewarded me with another. <laughs> um, tomato stalks and we'll see we'll see so jane started a lemon tree from a seed about three years ago it is in a three gallon pot presently it has never given me any fruit and the leaves are shriveled and look terrible any suggestions you know if you live in south florida you can actually plant a lemon tree from a seed and within a few years you're getting fruit because they grow like weeds year round in miami and homestead Anywhere north of there, unless you're really, really patient and you don't mind waiting many years for the tree to grow and outgrow its juvenile period and start to flower and get fruit, <clears throat> you're not going to get actual lemons off a lemon tree that came from a seed. There's no guarantee what variety it's going to grow into from a seed because there's a lot of genetic diversity. It will be a citrus tree. I can guarantee you, you will not get apples off of whatever that seed grows into and you will not get bananas you will get some kind of citrus but there's no telling what kind of citrus good bad kind of in between that's um, a lemon tree that the mother probably was I, I grafted a citrus tree of some kind so then if you take the the fruit and you're not using a graft or a clone tree like he said, you're, you're taking a seed. What you're doing is basically what people do, <laughs> you know, 
um, you know, my, my siblings and I are not all exactly the same because we're not cloned. We were grown from seed and that's, you know, that's how nature works too. So a lot of times if you take the seed from these edible crops, you're taking something that was grown in a greenhouse and very and probably grafted if it was citrus. So the seed's going to bring up something else, something wilder and you don't, you don't know what you're getting, just like with people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and citrus, of course, is prone to a number of different diseases. We do have problems with citrus greening, which, as a general rule, is going to turn the leaves yellow. And they'll drop off, and the tree over a year or so will die. So if the leaves are shriveled and look terrible, that could be anything from a disease to leaf miner to being too dry. So, um, Jane, we're going to show our emails at the end. If you want to take pictures and send them to us, that'd be great. We'll see what we can yeah, figure out from where, the pictures. You, basically. Yeah, say where you where you live. That will help determine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, you're do. always tell us where you live because I forget that we have people from South Florida and Broward mm -hmm. County and up in the Panhandle and even what was it, Michigan? Wisconsin. Wisconsin. I was getting yeah. this mixed up. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, we had a, a viewer from Wisconsin. So, of course, his growing conditions were very different up there than here. So, good morning, Cindy. How are you? And we have some passion vine questions here. Somebody asked about passion vine. Does it bear passion fruits and berries? Yes, it can. It will. It does. There are different varieties of passion vine. The fairly wild one or native one, I believe, that gets the purple flowers, the may pop. Mm -hmm. That, you know, I have that popping up all over my yard and I see fruits on it, but very rarely. Right. There are improved varieties the that they grow. Yeah. And down in Homestead, they grow it commercially. They grow it in rows on a trellis they have to replant it every couple years the, the vines are only good for a few years i believe and they grow i think a yellow variety down there that you see if you go to the grocery store and buy the juices that has passion fruit mm -hmm. juice in it that's where it comes from a south florida or you do have to be careful though because, um if you venture into the non-native passion vines there will be people out there who would argue that our native passion vine is pretty invasive when it really wants to take off. But no, it's not invasive. It's pioneering. Um, it's aggressive. It can yeah, be aggressive. It can be aggressive. So there are some ornamental passion vines that are not native, like the twin flower passion vines that have the yellow and red and stuff. Those are out and out invasive <laughs> non-native plants so you do have to be careful you know with that the purple passion vine is the host to the zebra longwing and the gulf fritillary butterflies mm -hmm. zebra longwings are state butterfly i never remember which one people tell me that one of them prefers the passion vine that's in the shade probably the zebra longwing and the other likes the passion vine that's out in the sun i believe that's correct mm -hmm. so it's great for butterfly usage but like you said if you really want to count on growing fruit you probably have to get one of those other varieties just be careful with the variety that you get and alicia has a question about how can I get rid of maggots in compost? If you have a compost bin and an, or a compost pile and it's too wet or it's too rich, like you worked in way too many kitchen scraps and things like that, it's going to be very, very attractive to different insects, including maggots. Now, um, soldier flies will lay their larvae and their maggots also. And they don't hurt anything. As a matter of fact, they're very beneficial. They've looked at using soldier flies in third world countries to help 
break down trash and they've looked at it in the U.S. at um, landfills, things like that, to actually inoculate a big pile with them to consume it and help break it down. So it's it's not a it's not a very fun topic to discuss, but technically maggots are not a huge issue in your compost as long as the ingredients are balanced yeah. and you're managing it correctly. It's not too wet, not too dry. It's not 100% leftover dinner scraps. You don't want to do that. If it's too wet, work in shredded paper, shredded newspaper. Works very well to help soak up the, the excess liquid and that should cut down the problem. But Please. composting is always going to attract a variety of insects and other than it them looking unpleasant, and not everybody likes insects like we do, uh, technically they're not really hurting anything. Um, yeah, just making sure you're not putting it in, in, in any animal products aside from eggshells. That's an animal product. You yeah, can no fat, no, no yeah. leftover spaghetti, no oily yeah. sauces. Right. I mean, if you have your spaghetti noodles in a bowl, you know, that are left over and they never touched any sauce or something, you could put those in. But some people don't think, you know, a lot of those mixed um, salads and everything, they have oils, they have creams, all those will be more attractive to those insects and possibly even a uh, pest wildlife. So make sure you're only putting vegetative kitchen scraps out there that don't have any butter, oil, uh, creamy stuff, you know, grease on them and add more of, see what we're talking about are the greens, you know, the nit nit nitrate, nitrogen things. You want to add more carbon. So like Bill said, even shredded paper, leaves, um, um, you know, some pine needles, pine needles, something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To try and put that more in balance. I have right now, I, I have too many of the carbons because I throw in um, the coffee grounds, which the coffee grounds are, are the greens. <laughs> they are nitrogen, but I throw in the filters as well, but I'm not throwing in enough of the other kitchen scraps. So it's like all coffee filters in there. So there's too much of the carbons. So, you know, I'm, I'm holding them. Um, just taking out the coffee filters for now and throwing those away, you know, shaking the coffee out <laughs> into my compost container that I take out there because there's too much of that. And I opened it to let it rain in there because mine is too dry. But yeah, I, sure put I, that lid, I put that lid back on before evening. <laughs> so. Yeah, I know for anybody with just an open pile or maybe one of the three bin systems, a lot of times you have to throw a tarp over it during the summer if it starts raining like every day, every other day. Otherwise, your compost pile turns into a big soggy mess with maggots. If you go, if you go to uh, Hernando County Government YouTube, and this one is on Bill's playlist, on the Hernando County Extension playlist, I think it's called Compost Happens or something like that. Bill and I, I think get, so. and get, we get into a lot of details on that. Okay, going back to those eggplants, uh, our Facebook user was placing the eggplants in full sun. And what about the placement of hot peppers? Both are going to benefit from some shade this time of year until mid to late August. Then they can go back into full sun. Right now, if they're in full sun and we have a very, and wow, I'm looking out the window. I don't see a cloud in the sky for right now. Of course, that might change in 10 minutes, but... If you have a very, very sunny day, things are going to dry out very quickly. They're going to burn up. They might get sunburned. So a little bit of shade this time of year definitely helps. And Lori says that she's having good luck growing cubanel and jalapeno peppers during the summer in raised beds. Yeah, a lot of times um, hot peppers will do pretty well during the summer. If you ever try growing bell peppers or green peppers, they're going to be the most susceptible to either burning up or succumbing to diseases during the summer. And we have a question here from Susan Freeman. 
who's in Northwest Gainesville and recently planted a native pollinator garden. That's great. The beautiful deer in my neighborhood ate my newly planted agapanthus to the ground. Deer will do that. Deer eat lots of different things. If you have hibiscus, I can tell you now, hibiscus is like crack for deer. They like it very much. She was told a product called Deer and Rabbit Mace by Nature's Mace was quite effective at repelling the deer after three applications. You need to apply it liberally to the plants and their perimeters, soak their surrounding soil. And she's concerned this stuff will harm the pollinators she's trying to attract. The active ingredients are... <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Putrescent whole egg solids. Oh, I love that name. Do you think that's close enough to poop to count no, for our it is poop not. reference Putrescent today? just means it's a name. It's a word that um, our Nando County Solid Waste uses a lot to <laughs> differentiate trash from garbage. Oh, garbage. Okay. See, I learned you know something. Those two today. things are two different things, and because garbage is putrescent. Think of the word putrid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I know. I understand <laughs> yeah. what the word means. I'm just not, I normally wouldn't use it, but. Putrescent whole egg solids would be a fantastic name for a band, don't you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're not going to hurt anything. They probably are going to stink, but the idea is that they stink and deer aren't going to yeah. like it and they're going to stay away. <clears throat> Garlic doesn't hurt anything. White pepper doesn't hurt anything. Peppermint oil doesn't hurt anything. Any of these, if you spray it directly on a pollinator, it's not going to be good for them. But if you're if you're putting it on the ground, it's not going to hurt them. Sodium laurel sulfate. Oh, so and, the deer can wash their hair. <laughs> this is what and here's another good one: potassium sorbet. Mm. Mm. On a hot summer night, a nice big bowl of potassium sorbet. Yeah, that sounds like banana ice cream or something. Banana sorbet. Mm -hmm. So, so Susan, all joking aside, they all sound fine for pollinators. Like Will I said, they work for the deer is the question. Yeah, and you really have to try it to find out. I've heard um, some of these products can work very well. Other ones don't work very well. What happens sometimes is they work very well for a while, but eventually the deer learn how to basically hold their nose and eat your plants anyway. So... Some of those things like um, CDs hung from a string mm -hmm. to kind of sparkle and the flashing scares animals away or the plastic owl. The plastic owl is the best because eventually every animal is looking at it, It's like, you know, that owl never moves. <laughs> so it's been it's, sitting there for two the weeks. It's, it's I'm going to try eating a strawberry anyway and then they kind yeah. of get over their fear of it so it may work the plastic out. owl is the equivalent of an empty sheriff's car <laughs> sitting on the road yeah <laughs> no very very good point and i saw that uh just a week or so ago um howie in the hills parked an empty police car alongside of the road and they had cut the grass that day along the median and they cut mm -hmm. around the police car <laughs> and the grass is really long it's like Okay, yeah, there's nobody in there. Yeah. <laughs> time to move move that decoy along somewhere. Yeah, so decoys and just physical, you know, garlic and smelly things that are going to deter them. Deterrence sometimes work really well, sometimes don't work at all. Sometimes they work well, but only temporary. I think the University of Florida has a publication on plants that deer don't like as much. You know, if they're, if they're hungry, they're going to eat anything. But there are some things that they love, like he's, like you said, hibiscus, apparently agapanthus, um, which is not native, um, but um, neither of those are. Um, you know, they're just some things that they happen to like. I know we have a listener, I don't know whether she's on today, has a continual issue with that in our Lake Lindsay area. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that's just the... I see people living, you know, near near a forest or where you happen to have a lot of deer. And we got a question about different varieties of passion fruit. And I could see that I assume as Teresa shared a link on Facebook there for um 
let me go ahead and show that. Everybody should have seen this in their feed, but Teresa shared a link for um, University of Florida fact sheet on passion vines. And Robin asks, what vegetables and fruits other than tomatoes have you had the most success growing? Good question. Very good. Um, you should let everyone answer that too. Sure. If anybody wants to chime in, the thing that you've had the most success with or is the easiest to grow, easiest thing to grow is radishes. If you grow them during the dead of winter, when it's chilly out, winter. So growing right, you can plant the seeds and in 30 days you can have radishes. So they're very, very easy. Radishes, you know, I've never had an insect pest. They don't get diseases. Um, mostly things that you grow in the winter I've had really good success with. Mm -hmm. Cherry tomatoes and aroma tomatoes, if you plant them at the right time, do really well. I have nematodes in my vegetable garden. So if I find tomato varieties that have the N, like uh, La Roma VFNT, the N stands for nematode resistance, they do really well. Broccoli during the winter. If you plant it between October and plan on it being done and pulled up by like mid-February, which is plenty, of, well, that's enough time to grow two crops of broccoli. Mm -hmm. Broccoli grows really, really well here, very easy to grow. So basically what I'm hearing is winter time is the, the easiest time to have a vegetable garden, that cool season. That's yeah, cool. fewer insect pests. You'll still get them. There's still caterpillars out in the winter and a few other things. And you'll get a few disease problems, but not a lot. Much, much easier to grow in the winter. Warm season things, beans. Green beans, yellow beans, purple beans, bush beans, pole beans. I planted um, yard-long beans. They're also called asparagus beans, and they're coming up. And I kind of got them in late, but they have enough time to grow but I'm not going to be picking them till October-ish or so. But it's still pretty warm then. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that you can be very, very successful with. Hardest things to grow, though. By far the hardest things to actually get food for the dinner table off of. Any kind of melons. Cantaloupes, watermelons, they're really tough. Summer squash, yellow squash and zucchini, that's really tough. Winter squash, cucumbers can be very, very tough. Timing is critical for them, and, and good luck with the weather. Because up north, you know, zucchinis, people are putting them on the neighbor's porches and running away because everyone is trying to get rid of all their zucchinis. But that's the that's the part that people don't think of when they get here. Yes, we can grow vegetables, but not at the same time that you're doing it up north. Here, I can go on my Facebook page here. Hey, look, we're on Facebook. Everything's working. <laughs> <laughs> um, and here, why don't you go ahead and answer the next question, and we'll see how long it takes for me to just randomly, because I'm a member of a lot of different Facebook gardening groups. How long does it take for me to run across a picture of a dead cucumber or dead tomato plant with somebody asking, what's wrong? What happened? And we'll we'll read the terrible advice that they give. I'm trying to um, find the, <laughs> the next question here. Um, oh. Um, here, how about these poor soils? Yeah, the poor soils one, that was next. How is Florida working towards building better soils for our future generations in our agricultural land management programs? Any policies for increasing organic matter in our agricultural soils? Also, with new development in Florida, is there a major decrease in agricultural land as time goes on? Neither one of us are agriculture agents, so we don't, we're, you know, that's not really our real house to answer. Um, and the University of Florida has agriculture agents. They also have soil scientists, don't they, Dr. Lester? who would be able to better yeah. answer as far as agriculture goes. What I can answer is um, as far as an urban, um, you know, urban homes, there, there is, there's research being done at the University of Florida by Dr. Eben Bean, correct? 
Phil? Yes, uh, among others, there's a lot of people working on it. And he, they've been for a while um, working up at On Top of the World in Marion County with test plots. And what they're doing is they are, before the sod gets put down, because what happens when they build a house? That's not natural soil there anymore, is it? It is fill dirt, which is sterile, <laughs> you know. Our topsoil is about two inches <laughs> deep. Um, so this fill dirt, which they find from digging up drainage retention areas or whatever, you know, it has that orangey kind of look to it. It's pretty sterile. So the research they've been doing is before sod gets laid down to add a compost product to that yard. And they have a place where they're getting this compost product out of like Panasofki product they've been using is called command with one M. Um, Which is, it's compost. It's just special inoculated compost. Right. And they've been working that in the soil, trying different ways, either just laying it, tilling it in, you know, doing all the research that universities do. And of course, those lawns are doing much better because that compost work into that fill dirt does help improve the nutrient holding and the water holding capacity of that soil. So if you have in your mind, well, my yard's already built, what do I do? You can also apply one of those compost materials, any kind of compost material. You don't have to go get that product. Uh, composted mushrooms, composted manure um, from a store that's safe. <laughs> um, you can um, top dress over your lawn, you know, once or twice a year. Um, to that's what you're going to have to do, even if you put the compost down before the sod, because as you know, we have very porous soil that's it's not going to last for years and years and years. So, but continually adding that does seem to very much help the fact that you're throwing sod down on this sterile soil. So, you add something in there to try and bring it back to something resembling something with nutrients, you know, and um, yeah and uh, the texture to it. Now- and there's really when, no laws or restrictions that they're implementing. It's just um, research has found, you know, obviously it makes sense. Plants mm -hmm. are gonna grow better. You're gonna get a higher harvest and it's gonna be more productive. So it's uh, what we recommend any grower does from the biggest farm down to the tiniest little backyard vegetable garden is build up the soil, use organic matter, try to keep things at home, don't put them in the trash. So try to uh, implement composting and return those things to your backyard. And those, it's more recommendations than actual requirements at this point. Uh, yes. And Hernando County is going, is working on, it's a, you know, the wheels of government run slowly, but uh, Carmen Bruno, the recycling coordinator, is in charge of creating what will eventually be a large scale composting program at um, the Hernando County land Landfill. My department will help contribute to that. So will all of our customers on our <laughs> sewer programs. Um, you know, sludge will be added into the uh, yard waste that's brought in. It's all, that's why it's taking so long because it all has to be extremely regulated. There has to be temperatures met every 30 days for, you know, a certain amount of time to make sure all the pathogens are killed out. The sludge that we give them is already really just the exoskeletons of, you know, processed wastewater. It's not actual poo. See, there, now there is the chance to bring the poo in, Bill. <laughs> um, and it always comes up every week for some reason. I don't know why. You, you will uh, be able to purchase it when it's ready by the truckload, even by the bag load. And Carmen had this wild, I thought this fabulous idea that he wants to um, be able to offer financial incentives to either home builders or sod um, producers to put this product down first. So I would love to see everyone, you know, that just become the routine. 
But as far as any kind of real agriculture questions, neither of us are qualified to answer that. Whatever county you're in, you can find your um, agriculture agent. Who is ours still, Laura? Look up it. She's the uh, uh, livestock. Matt, Matt Smith Matt is our small farms agriculture agent. And there is a Florida has a um, soil conservancy, uh, you know, department or, you know, as well. I think um, there's one in Pasco County, an office. You can always check with them. Um, I mean, our eyes see a decrease in agricultural land for everybody, but that does not necessarily translate to the agricultural production. So. We don't know. You know, Bill and I are not the experts on that. Did you find what you were looking for? No, I didn't really find anything interesting. I know yeah. recently it's been nothing but like pictures of dead cucumbers and dead tomatoes and people. What happened? Yeah, you live in Florida now. You don't live in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania or New York or Ohio. It's very different here. But we got a question about placement of a rosemary bush. Rosemary's take full sun. Rosemary is a uh, Mediterranean herb, and like all the other Mediterranean herbs, Doesn't they're not the happiest during the heat of summer because it's so humid and wet here. So it may start to decline a bit this time of year, but from fall through spring, all throughout the winter, they grow great. A lot, it's very easy to have a large rosemary bush, and basically, it's an evergreen bush, it's going to last forever. The um, master gardeners, I don't know why they took it out, maybe it started to go downhill. Um, years ago, had one at their nursery. Um, I swear it was the size of a Volkswagen beetle, <laughs> it, was, it was huge. Where I would put a rosemary, I always think I need to get one. Where I would put one is in the sun near my front door. So every time I'm walking in and out, I can rub my hand up it and have that wonderful aroma from the rosemary. And that would be also near my kitchen too, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had one for years. I need to get another one and put it somewhere. I'll find it, I'll work it out, I'll find a spot. Teresa asks, how do I successfully kill my camphor tree stump? Very easy. Right after you cut the stump, when it's freshly cut, spray either straight glyphosate or straight triclopyr on it. And she's tried glyphosate. Um, you have to make a strong concentration. If you read the label, it should have directions for cut stump treatment. And that's what it's called. Cut stump treatment. University of Florida has a publication on that. How about just getting it ground? You can have it ground out also. Why don't um, you hurry in there? You keep, um, you keep, uh, we keep mentioning we're going to show Teresa and it's almost 11. You should have, make her come in there and show her, show herself because she is really the magic behind everything that happens. Teresa, go in Bill's office. We want to see you. <laughs> no, here, I'll send her an uh, uh, invite. Give me just okay. a second here. Because I bet you she was asking that question for someone else. <laughs> so, yeah, but if you hire a stump grinder, that should take care of your your issue with your camphor tree. Yeah, but they charge money. Of course they do, yes. Well, the glyphosate is going to cost money, too. So, if you happen to have an arborist out there or someone, you know, take care of your trees, say, hey, can you grind this up? And then a follow-up question about the rosemary <sighs> needs very uh, about fertilizer. Needs very little fertilizer, just a very light scattering a couple times a year. Six 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 ten ten ten. Any of those general purpose ones are going to work. You don't need any kind of specialty fertilizer for rosemary. Mm -hmm. And we're getting questions, random questions about mangoes and pineapple. And, you know, we have a video about how to grow pineapples here in Central Florida. Once again, uh, that should be up. Yeah, I sent that to John a while back. That should be up on Hernando County's YouTube on growing pineapples. But you can grow pineapples here in Hernando County very easily. They do very well here. 
across Central Florida, they do well. Mangoes are a little tougher. There are varieties of mangoes that take the cold a little bit better, but there's no really cold tolerant mangoes. You have to cover them when they're young, when it gets really, really cold at night during the winter. So you're going to have to give them some cold protection. Other than that, people across Central Florida grow them and get mangoes. Mm -hmm. Cindy has a really good question here. Um, someone wrote that they were fertilizing their plants. But they were not blooming. She couldn't remember the combination of fertilizer. One of the answers was depending on the combination, all of the energy would only be going to the leaves. This was on Facebook. Is that true? Is that possible? Actually, yes, Cindy, that was true <laughs> on Facebook. Um, you know, those three numbers, I show they are nitrogen, potassium, and PK. <laughs> now I lost what they are. What are those three? Oh. NPK? NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Phosphorus and potassium. Okay. The reason we don't want a high middle number for our lawns is because we number one have plenty of phosphorus in our soil number two that phosphorus is what we when you see something called a boom you know a boom bloom buster you know bloom something that's really going to help blooms it has that phosphorus in it our lawns don't need any help blooming there's nothing we want them to bloom so when you are talking about uh helping flowers bloom that middle number you know that phosphorus that's what helps the blooming process is that correct yes that's correct mm -hmm. and that first number the nitrogen nitrogen makes plants leaves. grow fast and grow green so for your lawns since that's all you you know your grass doesn't bloom or give you fruit or food you just want it to grow and be green lawn fertilizers could be typically like 16 4 8 so they have a lot of nitrogen for flowering plants, you really want less nitrogen. Palm fertilizer is lower in nitrogen, and citrus fertilizer is lower in nitrogen because you don't want those to grow super fast. You want them to grow, but you want your citrus to flower and get fruit. So for hibiscus and anything else that you want to flower, there are they're called bloom boosters or bloom plus or bloom something or other fertilizer, and you probably want to try one of them. And if you read the numbers, you're going to see it's relatively low nitrogen compared to the phosphorus and potassium. Okay. See, we answered that rather simply, too. Yep. <laughs> um, lots of questions today. <laughs> Here's one that I agree with, kind of. Cindy says, we have such mixed messages in Pinellas County. They talk nonstop about sustainability and then keep building. Hmm. Funny. We I think we see that no matter where you live in Florida, you're seeing that. And it could be Absolutely. in Ellis County, which is completely built out. It could be Dixie County, which they probably still have more cows there than people. <laughs> but everywhere is growing. And it's yeah. difficult because even though we work with people and we encourage them, you know, through the fertilizer practices, irrigation, encouraging wildlife, when you drive down the street and you see more subdivisions going in, it really, it just, it makes you wonder. It's, it makes you wonder. Yes. My, my neighborhood is becoming a real actual neighborhood. And, you know, for years it was pretty much out in the woods. So, you know, that's, and I would say, Cindy, we have as many people coming from Pinellas County to live here in Hernando as we do coming from up north. You know, we have years. They, they came from somewhere else, went to Pinellas. Pinellas is too congested for them to come up here. Um, but you're certainly welcome. You know, we welcome them all. But all it seems like all they're doing is transferring populations around and building around, too. Yeah, if you're trying to get away from crowded areas and hustle and bustle, you're just going to end up having to keep moving because mm -hmm. not that many years, Fernando's going to be full, and you have to move to Dixie, and then you move to Georgia. What do you think, 
What do you think the least populated counties would be? Well, they're all up north, right? You said like Dixie. Yeah. Uh, so, some of those Panhandle counties, there really are more cattle than there are people, but not for long. Mm -hmm. Hamilton <sighs> County, maybe. See, Teresa's saying that she's on the phone. Yeah, right. I sent her yeah, on the phone. Sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> she's on the phone and people are asking her how to kill a <laughs> camper tree. <so>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. It's about that time. So I think that we're going to answer one more question here from Lori. And I'll start showing our emails and everything else in just a moment. But Lori asks Are there any varieties of avocado that will grow here in Hernando County? Yes and no. There right. are. <laughs> there are um, varieties of. Haas avocados, uh, uh, Mexican something that are supposed to be more cold tolerant. Um, the problem with growing avocados here in Hernando County now is if you have a little one growing in your yard or you go out to big box store and you buy one that's, I don't know, four feet tall and you plant it. We have a beetle that went through the county a number of years ago that, um, what do they kill? What's that, that forest bay, tree? The bay, bay trees. trees. Yes. So it's um Ambrosia beetle. Ambrosia beetle that attacks bay laurel trees first, avocados second, and they can attack camphor trees third. Because believe it or not, they're all very closely related. You know, they don't kill camphor trees, but they will drill into a big branch and kill a big branch. Mm. So if you guys have a camphor tree. Make sure you have an arborist check it on some kind of regular basis, lest you end up with big dead branches that fall on your car. Or you could let him prune it. You could let him prune it with one big pruning cut at the bottom. <laughs> and then pull up that publication on cut stump treatment <laughs> yes. to find out how to keep it from coming back. So we covered a lot today. If anybody wants to get any information from Lily, there is her email. And anything about rain barrel classes for Hernando County residents, compost bin classes for Hernando County residents when we get compost bins back in. And they're coming. They're on their way. They're slowly driving down the highway from Canada, hopefully, yeah. sitting in a parking lot. Sitting at Denny's, they're somewhere, they're on their way. <laughs> and if anybody Pilot. has Isn't that, pilots have the truck stops, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, we don't know where they are, but you know, it's it's the supply chain issue. So, we've got about 46 people on the waiting list. So, so prepare yourself, Bill, for probably three compost bin classes in a row when they get them in. That's fine. We'll get them knocked out. Hey, let's just let's just let them also. We'll bring them all in. We'll do it here in person. We'll fill that room. Haven't done that for quite a few years. Yeah, I don't think Carmen. Uh, yeah, you teaching it is one thing. <laughs> Him actually passing them out and handling them is another. So we're probably going to break them up into. He has access to big trucks. Just load it up. <laughs> And eventually, the goal is then to get everyone us back on our schedule of combined rain barrel and compost bin classes. So maybe in the fall. Okay, I see Susan McDaniel squeezed in one last really quick question here, really quick. She says, "Am I the only one who can't grow crepe myrtle?" Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> it now has white flies, and I can't beat them. Using insecticidal soap over and over to no avail. Insecticidal soap will kill those white flies. You know what I would do? Is it just get try another one in another location. You know, it could be just the spot where you have it. Mm -hmm. It just crate myrtle doesn't. Could be. It because it's probably distressed anyway, which is what's attracting it to be so attacked by the by those insects. That could be, and technically crepe myrtles 
do not like to be fussed over. You can put them out by the road in the full sun, no irrigation. You don't have to primp and fertilize them and keep them perfectly happy. They like to be ignored. And they and once they get settled in, they'll do just great. So for that reason, they're very good, durable plants. I've transplanted them before. And you can literally take a shovel, dig them up, pop them out of the ground, drag them across the lawn, stick them in another hole, and they survive and they do just fine. So yeah, they are very, very tough. You shouldn't prune them. I mean, what are your pruning practices? People tend to way over prune crate myrtles. Just trim lightly in like February, late January or February. Late and lightly February, means grow. just really cleaning out the middle, you know, of, it, you know, take off anything that's smaller than a pencil, all that twiggy growth and everything, but mm -hmm. don't follow the example of all the, you know, uh, everyone who just thinks they need to hat rack them. Um, <laughs> you know that that could be the issue maybe you're just loving it too much yeah 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 if you're giving it a lot of attention and it's in a partly shady spot if it's getting watered a lot from maybe your uh lawn irrigation if you're running it it may be getting too much water so crepe myrtles and pine trees do not want your attention they want to be ignored and left alone and not watered not fertilized not primped over and they'll do just great that pine trees hate all that care also mm -hmm. they're very ungrateful plants but if, if <laughs> no, you learn how to ignore them yeah they just you know they're introverts <laughs> they be left alone and then they will bloom i've noticed every other year the white ones always bloom first they have always 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 bloom first this year all the other varieties bloom before the whites even decided to come out i'm not sure what that was about but you know there can be interesting barometers but i'm not sure what they're telling us <laughs> so yeah i wouldn't use any insecticide i would just uh you know i think you already have given it way too much love <laughs> and oh it's in full sun yeah, does it get fertilized with the lawn is another question, like Bill brought up. And I have a blog post I just pulled up here. Bum, 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 bum. Let me make sure they have managed control methods. Here is a very good um, blog post, and it has all the different chemical controls that are going to be effective and labeled for ornamental plants. Because it's ornamental and you're not eating it, there's a lot more um, options. As the Florida friendly <laughs> coordinator, though, I would say if the plant isn't, if the plant has to have that much attention with um, insecticides and stuff, I would get rid of that plant. And you know, maybe try, try a different variety. Plant. I don't know what variety you got, but yeah, generally, generally they're very uh, easy to grow, and if you're having constant problems with it there may be an underlying reason what i always say is if you are working harder than your plant then that's not a florida friendly plant and i went ahead and shared um on both facebook and youtube you should be able to see it the uh, university of florida um this is a blog post uh white fly control in ornamentals and it has a whole list of all the different chemical controls. There's a lot of stuff that will kill a white fly. They're not hard to kill. They can be hard to get rid of, though, because you tend to have a lot of them, and you got to kill them all. Otherwise, they make babies real quick and come back. So, guys, I think that's about all the questions for today. Boy, that was quite a few, wasn't it? Yes, it was. That kept us really on point today. <laughs> So. But but keep those questions coming. Keep those emojis coming. Um, <laughs> and Susan, you're very very welcome. Um, here, Cindy's hold on ready. just a second. Um, Cindy's thinking about moving up here. I think. <laughs> what do we What are we looking for now? Here, I'm looking for something. I need to open it up.
here we go. I'm copying it. And I'm going to go ahead and paste it in the comments section here. And what this is, it's a link to a very, very short survey. <clears throat> uh, University of Florida uses a company called Qualtrics. So it's safe to click on that link. You're just going to go to a very short survey where we ask you if basically have you learned anything from watching us? I know we're terribly entertaining and it's always amusing to watch us, but have you learned anything? <laughs> and have you been able to implement anything that we've shared or directed you to for whether it be a publication or another source or a link that we shared or sent you to help you solve a lawn or garden problem or water or trees or I mean we talk about everything on here. Mm -hmm. So very short, just a couple questions survey. If everybody can go ahead and take that, only take it once. Don't go back in there every week taking the same survey over and over. But if you've never taken this before, if you can click on that link and answer this questions very quickly and honestly, we really appreciate that. That would be really great. We always try to, um, you know, evaluate how we're doing. And we'd like to show our superiors that what we're doing here is a lot more than just going online and talking about poo every week. So there are more important well, that's why I come here. That's why I come, you know, just to talk about poo. Well, sure. I mean, that's 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 the common thread every yeah. week. <laughs> <laughs> and Cindy, no, this is the same one. If you've already gone and filled out a Qualtrics survey, you don't have to do it again. But I need to remember to show this every single week a few times so we can catch everybody that pops in, pops out, uh, all of our new viewers, which is great. Um, <laughs> You know, I need to start promoting this and sharing it more on Facebook so we get more people to, to tune in. Yeah, and master gardeners who tuned in this morning. Yeah, and I know that coming up, I'm going to be out of town on occasion. So uh, Lily is going to bring back everybody's favorite, Bernie. <laughs> Bernie. <laughs> to Bernie answer the hard questions. Yes. He likes to speak with authority. <laughs> so, uh, I think they like me to like calming him down. <laughs> okay. But Bernie, yeah, let me double check. Oh well, I was about to say I'll be here next week, but I can't. I can't guarantee that. I will hopefully, almost definitely, be here next week. I may be doing it from uh, undisclosed locations. Okay. Well. You know, I'm here, so. Um, Boy, Lily has her fans. Yes. Yeah. And Susan's going to do the survey, so thank you. And with that, guys, I think we're, oh, my gosh, look at the time. We're going to run. <laughs> yeah. And somebody will be back on here again next Thursday at 10 a.m. It will hopefully be the two of us and hopefully a guest. Mm -hmm. I'll try. I'll get a hold of somebody and invite them. Yeah, Dr. Lester has a potential family situation that could occur at any time. So I am here. I should be able to, you know, help cover. So. But I got a laptop and I got a webcam. Mm -hmm. And if I have internet, all I have to do is put on a shirt. I could do it in my pajamas if I really had to, but I won't. I'll get dressed for the occasion. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll come on and we'll do this again to answer everybody's questions. So. Hey, I got an email this week that was um, addressed to Dr. Browning. I want you to know that. <laughs> oh, boy, you got promoted, didn't you? I did get promoted. I didn't have to go through all the work that you did or anything. <laughs> and then when I very nicely corrected her, um, she then um, replied, Professor Browning. <laughs> I'm just going to keep taking it. That's fantastic. <laughs> okay. Well, I think with that, we're going to go. So we'll hopefully see all of you back here again next week, next Thursday morning at 10 a.m. Somebody will be here. So probably I should be here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Dr. Browning will be joining us then. So. so until then, doctor, you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you later.